Hello everyone, this is Dr. Omran Bishbish. Uh, I'm a third year pair resident at Loma Linda University School of Dentistry. And first I would like to thank Dr. Aldomani for his invitation to give this lecture. And what I'm gonna be talking about today is uh, bone grafting techniques, uh, preservation versus augmentation. So we're gonna talk about some definitions and then uh, I'm gonna briefly touch on socket alterations after extractions, what will happen to the socket after we remove the tooth. And then the socket preservation techniques, we'll talk about bone grafting materials. And then finally, we'll be talking about some bone augmentation techniques. So when we talk about bone grafting in general, we have to differentiate between two main categories of procedures that we do. Uh, first procedure is called alveolar ridge preservation or socket preservation. And the other procedure is called ridge augmentation. So the alveolar ridge preservation is the procedure that we do to try to preserve the dimensions of the socket at the same time when we do the extraction. So we took the tooth out and we wanna preserve the bone or the socket dimension as it is as much as we can. The other procedure is called ridge augmentation. So in ridge augmentation, we have a heel site already. There is no extractions. We need to place extra bone in that site in order to gain some volume of the bone for our implant or our future prosthesis. And there is key differences between the two procedures. We'll get, discuss it as we go in this lecture. So this is a, a, a demonstration or nice like figure taken from an article uh, done by Dr. Alian. They classified the socket of the teeth into three types, type one, type two, type three. And we can see that in type one, there is the sockets are intact. The socket walls are intact. Soft tissue almost is also intact. And uh, type two, there is some bone loss or loss of the socket wall, especially on the facial, but the soft tissue is still at a good level. And type three, where we have a loss of bone and soft tissue together. And this is a nice article, I encourage everybody to, to, to read it, but basically type one and type two are good candidates for socket reservation techniques. And type three is the type of sockets that will not improve upon socket preservation and it will need an additional augmentation later after the tooth is removed. So what happens to the tooth after extractions? A lot of studies have been done. Uh, one of the systematic reviews that gathered all these studies together was done by Lang and they found that um, horizontally we lose almost 3.8 on average, 3.8 millimeter range between 29 and 36% of the original width. We lose it over six months. And the height or the vertical reduction is also mean 1.2 millimeter or 11 to 22% of the original height. We lose it in six months. Another uh, study done by Dr. Araujo in 2015, they or he concluded that 50% of the ridge width will be resorbed. And this bone resorption will occur mainly at the buccal, buccal aspect. So after we remove the tooth, the bone start to heal, but unfortunately it will collapse, it will shrink. Uh, this shrinkage is more on the molar region. So the reason for that is the molar have a bigger socket than the anterior teeth or the big molar. So we, we, will, we will see more reduction if we have a bigger socket. But this reduction is more critical in the anterior region uh, because of the aesthetic demand. So the 
anterior region and the premolars are critical areas uh, because any loss of the socket dimension will have a significant impact in our aesthetic uh, demands and also on the amount of bone available for implant placement. Uh, the, this reduction after extraction <clears throat> is affected by several factors. One of them is the surgical trauma. As we all know, if we lay out a flab and remove bone and the extraction was traumatic, we're going to end up with more bone loss. Um, also, a big factor is the thickness of the buccal bone. Uh, the more the, the thicker the bone, the less reduction is going to happen. Also, in uh, lack of buccal bone and periodontally involved teeth as well, we're going to see more significant reduction. So eventually, this, this is what happened. On the diagram on the top, after the tooth extractions, uh, the area starts to heal with the with formation of a blood clot, and then the bones start to resorb, especially on the facial, and we end up with a pointed ridge most of the time. And our goal in socket preservation is to go on the lower diagram here, fill this hole with bone and try to prevent or reduce the amount of resorption as much as we can. So we'll end up with a little bit wider ridge that can receive our implant. <clears throat> this is a nice article done by Dr. Ortiz. It's a, again, it's a systematic review. They collected a lot of articles uh, from different sources and it has a nice conclusion uh, or nice remarks at the end. Uh, they're saying again that the socket will shrink. The horizontal shrinkage is going to be more pronounced in the anterior uh, area, especially on the buccal bone. They're saying the thicker the facial bone, the less ridge resorption, as we, as we talk about as well. And also, they're saying that the um, in non-molar sites are more likely to be associated with an increased need for bone grafting uh, at the implant placement compared to molar sites. So the more anteriorly in the jaw you go, premolars and anterior teeth, the more shrinkage that you're gonna have in the bone after removing the tooth, and the more likely you're gonna end up having additional bone grafting uh, if you wanna have an implant placed. Also, uh, they uh, studied or they had a collection of data and then summarize the, the, the data about uh, socket preservation. Uh, and they're, they're uh, concluded that uh, the socket preservation techniques or the bone grafting at the same time of extraction will prevent the horizontal uh, resorption by almost two millimeters and the vertical resorption by 1.7 millimeter. And this is again, mean numbers. So uh, two millimeters is a good amount of bone, especially in the horizontal uh, dimension in the anterior area that might be all what we need is two millimeter of bone. And uh, uh, they're also, uh, uh, one of the conclusions is that uh, application of xenograft or allogenic materials <clears throat> covered with a, a resorbable collagen membrane or any type of collagen sponge is the most favorable uh, technique to do socket preservation. And we'll take a look at the socket preservation techniques down the road. And also they reported that sites presenting with buccal bone thickness more than one millimeter exhibited more favorable ridge preservation outcomes compared to site with a thinner buccal bone. So again, the thicker the facial bone, the less resorption that we have, and also the thicker the buccal bone, the more favorable outcome we will have after our 
bone graft or after our socket preservation. <clears throat> this is an illustration uh, which highlights the important or the importance of the facial bone thickness or the buccal bone thickness. And at the top left here, we see a socket uh, immediately after extractions. And we can see that the facial bone is very thin, less than a millimeter, maybe less than 0.5 millimeters. And we can see eight weeks down the road, how it healed. The whole facial bone had collapsed. And uh, the area most likely is going to be filled up with soft tissue and we're going to end up with the knife edge crest in here. Uh, whereas in the uh, bottom left uh, radiograph or CT scan, the, this is the socket after, again, after immediately, immediately after removing the tooth. But the facial bone here is more than one millimeter, I would say a one and a half to two millimeters. And we can see the alteration after eight weeks, which the socket still in, almost intact. There's some remodeling vertically and horizontally, but this buccal wound, buccal wall is protecting the inside of the socket from soft tissue collapse. And the uh, bone is already forming in the, inside the socket. And may, most likely in this type of socket, we're gonna end up with a significant amount of bone that will be enough for our implant placement. Uh, another couple of studies that uh, illustrates the need for uh, additional grafting and they compare uh, the need for additional grafting between socket preservation or between just natural healing without doing anything. And they found that when we do socket preservation, zero to 15% of the cases will need additional grafting in the future if we replace implants. On the other hand, if we let the area heal spontaneous, spontaneously, um, the need for grafting is gonna be between zero to 100%. So that's a big difference between both. Another uh, article also by uh, Dr. Ortiz, um, also uh, concluded that 48% uh, of the sites where there was no bone grafting done, these sites needed additional grafting compared to 11.5% of the areas that had a socket preservation at the time of extraction. So we can see the importance of socket preservation procedures, especially in the anterior and premolar areas. What about the molar sites? Uh, this is also a newly published uh, article and uh, they're comparing uh, site preservation uh, for molar sites, specifically for uh, maxillary molar sites. Uh, and the conclusion was that the alveolar uh, preservation in the maxillary molars maintained the vertical bone height more efficiently and resulted a less need for sinus segmentation than spontaneous healing. So in this diagram here, we can see that um, they took the tooth out, they placed the graft, and we can see the results after six months where we still have some bone vertically. We still have some bone to place our implant where in the lower left side, they removed the tooth, no bone graft was placed, and they found that uh, there was not enough vertical height to place an implant and there is a need for sinus augmentation as well. Uh, does that always work? Uh, we, I, I, I don't think so. We, it's case by case and we need to uh, <clears throat> exam our case very carefully. For example, this case, <clears throat> I had tooth number 14 needed to be removed and when we take a look at the CT scan, we can see that there's no socket walls that are left. Buccal wall is almost gone. Lingual wall is very, very thin. 
and also the sinus is already pneumatized between the roots here. So when, when I take this tooth out, there is basically no socket to place our graft. So the graft is going to be lost. And this is what happened exactly after the extractions. I placed some bone grafting uh, material and I sutured it. And this is what happened after six months. We can see that the uh, bone graft still holds a little bit on the buccal side, nothing on the lingual. And we for sure need a sinus augmentation here. And the reason why we end up with such a, a result is that the sinus is already pneumatized between the roots. So there is nothing can be done here. So what are the indications for the uh, site preservation or the ridge preservation? We, we, when we wanna do it, we wanna do it when we wanna place implant, but we cannot do an immediate implant placement. Uh, when this uh, immediate implant can, cannot be done, like if the, there's no primary stability or if the patient uh, doesn't want to have the implant right now for financial reasons, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the other indication is to keep the ridge contour for conventional prosthetic treatment as well, like a bridge. We don't wanna end up with a very long pontic that might be anesthetic at all and uh, also for reducing the need for elevation for sinus floor, as we saw in the last article that we presented. So let's uh, jump into the surgical procedure. And uh, first we wanna start with uh, tooth removal, as traumatically as possible. So we will not destroy these socket walls because they are very important to contain our bone graft in the socket walls. And we can use different type of uh, instruments. <clears throat> One of the instruments is the periotome, which is like an elevator, but it has a very thin head that we can place it in the PDL uh, space and uh, tap it with the mallet slowly, slowly until the, the tooth is luxated and then we can take it out. Uh, another instrument is called the autotome, which is basically same as the periotome, but we can mount it on a handpiece and an implant motor and the handpiece will, will do the tapping for us and instead of uh, using a mallet for that. And it's a very useful, useful tool. Uh, forceps, there is different type of forceps in the market. You can use whatever you feel comfortable with. I 90, 80 to 90% of my extractions, I deliver it atraumatically using a forceps. And also, uh, finally, we can use some of these uh, atraumatic uh, or vertical uh, extraction kits, uh, like the Benetex, where we can deliver the tooth vertically without damaging the socket walls as well. This is like a, a demonstration or a case of where it's done with a vertical extraction kit. Uh, as you can see, the, it's, it's tooth number six, the canine, severely decayed. And once we place a, a, uh, a forceps on the tooth, the crown is gonna break off. So, and that's exactly what happened. So we use this kit that has different tools. Uh, it has some uh, metal um, a post you can screw it inside the uh, tooth or the root. And then you, there is a piece that you place it on the adjacent teeth to protect the adjacent teeth from being fractured. It has a, like a silicone uh, uh, lining in it. And then you use this tool to luxate this, uh, uh, this root and take it out. And uh, as you can see, we, I, I was able to remove the tooth automatically as possible, the facial wall is intact, no flab was reflected, and everything is favorable in this case. The second step after we deliver the tooth is to uh, debride the socket. We wanna make sure that 
we clean all the soft tissue from inside the socket. Any soft tissue that will remain inside the socket will make our bone graft basically useless and the bone graft will not heal uh, very well. Uh, we don't wanna leave any infection residues as well there because we don't want that to uh, interfere with the uh, bone graft healing. We can use different instruments. Uh, mainly I use curettes. Cu uh, curettes. Uh, you can use also, um, some people use um, piezo to instrument the socket. I don't, but you can use any instrument you would like to gently remove the soft tissue and the infection without destroying the socket walls. And at this stage, after we remove the tooth and we remove the soft tissue, we wanna make a very important decision. We want to evaluate the socket walls. So we, with an instrument like a, a, a curette or a perioprope, we wanna go and inspect, and inspect our socket walls. Uh, most likely all the walls gonna be intact except for the facial wall. It's gonna be having the most problems if a problem happens, sometimes the lingual. So I'm gonna take a look and see how is the, uh, the, the, the socket wall looks like. And if the socket wall looks intact, no uh, fenestration or uh, dehiscence, that's a good sign. Then we continue with, with placing our graft material inside the socket and then we cover it with simply with a collagen plug or a collagen tape or a collagen membrane, whatever you wanna use. You can use a non-resorbable membrane as well, like a BTFE membrane, no problem at all. Uh, also some people use micrograft seal, which is a collagen matrix that will promote soft tissue uh, cell migration and healing and it will help with the soft tissue maturation and better healing of the soft tissue in the area, especially for high aesthetic demand area, totally fine as well. You place that and you just uh, suture it with a crisscross suture and the procedure is done. What about if the socket walls are not intact? If you find adhesions in one of the walls, and mainly we're talking again about the buccal walls, then we need to use some type of membrane to recreate this wall and to prevent the soft tissue from collapsing. Uh, you can use a resorbable mem membrane, like a collagen membrane, cut it uh, in like a ice cream cone shape and place it in the area, like in the diagram here. Uh, I think Guy Sledge have, uh, which is a company that uh, have some bone grafting materials and um, uh, also membranes, they have already pre-made collagen membrane in the shape of ice cream cone, you can use it as well. You create a small pouch on the, uh, around your defect, and then you place uh, your membrane two to three millimeters beyond the defect uh, margins. And then you continue by filling the area with bone graft, and then you fold the membrane on top and you do your suturing. Uh, also, you can use a non resorbable membrane, which works very well in these uh, type of scenarios because it's, uh, it's first, it's non resorbable and second, it will, it has some rigidity in it. So it will preserve the space uh, very well and prevent your soft tissue from collapsing like on the left uh, picture here, we have a PTFE membrane. It's basically a, like a Teflon material, very smooth and does not collect bacteria. Uh, you can, again, create a pouch on the buccal uh, soft tissue and then place that membrane, place your bone graft and fold the membrane on top of the bone graft and just suture on top of it with a crisscross suture. And this membrane, you can leave it up to six weeks without any problem. And yes, you can leave it exposed. And this is a key difference between <clears throat> socket preservation and ridge augmentation that we're gonna be talking about later, which is 
in the socket preservation techniques, you can keep your membrane exposed. That's fine. So let's talk about the bone grafting materials. <clears throat> what can uh, we use? And uh, mainly and historically, the bone graft has been categorized into different categories. We all know about uh, osteogenics or osteogenic bone graft, which is, has the potential for formation or development of a new bone because it has cells contained in the graft. And mainly here, we're talking about <clears throat> allograft, which is bone taken from the same individual. The other category is osteoinductive, where as the bone grafting material have molecules or materials in the graft that converts the neighboring cells into osteoplasts. And uh, here we're mainly talking about uh, allograft, historically about allograft materials taken from uh, cadaver uh, of the same species. Or recently there is some development in the uh, BMB products as well <clears throat> and other products and we'll, we'll talk about them later. The other category is the osteoconductive which is basically uh, works as a scaffold that allows formation of new bone. It's uh, basically it's a filler material, does not have any osteogenic or osteoinductive potentials. And uh, it just preserves the space for us for the other cells to come in and form new bone, hopefully. And here we're talking about uh, mainly about xenograft materials and uh, other uh, bone substitute. So uh, autogenous bone is bone taken from the same individual. Uh, it has the potential of formation of a new bone because it's osteogenic. It has cells inside it, um, which is uh, osteogenic cells like osteoplasts. And uh, it can form bone. So it's the best bone that you can use is the autogenous bone, especially if you're doing ridge augmentation. Uh, you can harvest it locally by scraper or ronjo or different materials, uh, especially if you have a big flap open, you have a neighboring area of bone, uh, you can just scrape some uh, with a scraper and you can get a significant amount of bone. Uh, also, you can collect it as a bone graft uh, block from the symphysis or the, the uh, ramus or the angle of the mandible. Uh, <clears throat> some oral surgeons also, they take some from the iliac uh, crest, uh, from the ribs, from the calvarium, all of that. Uh, you can use tori or exostosis and uh, we don't know about the uh, osteogenic potential of the tori or the exostosis because it's basically very, very dense bone. Uh, and uh, the issue with the, with the autogenous bone uh, is that it has the morbidity of a secondary uh, surgical site. So if you have to open the chin or the uh, ramus, to get uh, some bone from there. It's an additional surgery. It's an additional healing, it's an additional swelling, additional pain. So that's a big problem. Otherwise it's one of the best bone that we can use. Uh, one downside for autogenous bone, especially if it's a scraped is that, uh, or if it's like a, a, a if it's scraped or if it's uh, if it's a, a, taken as a particulate bone, bone not, a, not as like a block of graft, is that it will resorb fast. So if you place it in a socket, it will quickly resorb. Uh, it will not hold the, 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 the space for, for us. The other type of bone is uh, the allograft bone, which is harvested from an individual other than uh, the, 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 the patient, uh, but it's from the same species, so from humans, uh, mainly from cadavers. Uh, it has osteoinduction uh, potentials, and uh, the osteoinduction 
potential is debated as well. Might be significant, might be not, but it is there. Uh, no donor side morbidity, which is a plus. And this allograft can be either mineralized or demineralized. So and when they process the bone, they can keep the minerals or they can remove some minerals. And we will see in the next slide, what does that mean? And it comes uh, as a cortical bone uh, taking from the cortex or cancellous bone or a mixture of cortical and cancellous. Basically the cortical bone will resorb slower. So it will hold the space better. The cancellous bone will resorb faster, but it has, maybe it has more osteoinduction potentials. Uh, most of the bone grafts in the market are mixture of cancellous and cortical. And also it comes as a particles, as mainly used as particles, as we all know. It also comes as a cortical plate. So um, it's a, plate of bone, but it's taken from the cadavers. And it also can come in a cortical cancellous block taken from the iliac crest of a cadaver bone as well. So what does that mean to have a mineralized or demineralized bone? The mineralized called FDBA or freeze dried bone allograft. The demineralized is called demineralized freeze dried bone allograft. The freezing and the drying is, uh, steps of the processing of the bone after being harvested from the cadaver. They clean it and they chemically treat it and they freeze it and they dry it in order to make it uh, safe to be used. Um, the demineralized, they remove the minerals of the bone or some of the minerals for the bone. And they claim that this process will uh, expose the proteins and also the BMBs uh, in that bone and make it more osteoinductive. The evidence on that is not really hard and uh, basically, we don't know, it's just a claim. Um, and, the, and the evidence of the whole osteoinduction uh, potential of the allograft also is not very hard if we look into the, uh, the literature. So it depends on which study you read, you will have different uh, results, but mainly there is some osteoinductive potentials. And this bone graft, which is the allograft, eventually will resorb and be replaced by the autogenous bone, hopefully. This is a uh, bone graft uh, material or allograft material uh, from uh, Zimmer. It's called the Puros. And uh, this is different from the other allograft in, in terms of the processing. So they did not do any freezing or drying here. Here they do a process, um, they do delipidization and then osmotic treatment and then the, uh, some uh, oxidative treatment. And then they treat the uh, bone with solvent to do dehydration in, instead of freezing. And then they do low dose uh, gamma radiation. Uh, and they, they claim that this process preserved the valuable minerals in the bone <clears throat> and also the collagen matrix and tissue integrity while inactivating the pathogens. Uh, this is also uh, a bone grafting that I've been using for in the past, I would say three years and gets very, very good results. And it's different than the other bone grafts in the market. So uh, when also we talk about the allograft, we need to uh, look at the bone bank. Where does this bone graft comes from? There's different bone banks or tissue bank and different companies that uh, 
uh, that makes this uh, bone grafting materials and they deal with different tissue banks. So uh, some of the studies show that the bone formation capability differs between the tissue banks. And uh, some of the studies as well show that uh, uh, the, the new bone formation is, uh, might be age dependent, but not gender dependent, which means that the younger the donor, the more bone formation potential you will have in the bone compared to a, uh, a, an or older person or older cadaver. And uh, uh, there was no difference in particle size. So you can use the particle size that you would, would like, that is convenient for you. Most of the time, uh, 0.25 to one millimeter is a good size uh, for a bone grafting material. Uh, so again, you need to look at the company that forms your bone graft and choose a nice company, a good company that deals with a good tissue bank. So we'll have a better results. The other bone graft material is the xenograft material, which is a graft from a donor uh, of a different species from the recipient. Uh, mainly it's uh, from a bovine source or a cow bone. It has an osteoconductive potential, which is like a just a framework uh, to hold the space or to keep the space. It's a deproteinized mineralized bone matrix. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, bone matrix incompletely resorbed. And uh, for this reason, it will hold the space very, very well. So cadaver bone, they say it resorbs, but in reality, it takes a long time for it to resorb. And sometimes it doesn't resorb. So it will hold, it will stay there. It will hold the space. Uh, it gives a great results. Uh, especially for sock preservation. But the question will remain is, do you want your implant to be in contact with this material that does not resorb? Uh, it's like a piece of rock, basically. Do you want your implant to be next to, to a piece of rock? We, we don't know the answer for that. People have been using this for years and with no problems. Some other people report some problems and they start mixing it with autogenous bone for better results. And mainly it's used as well. The other good use for, for it is the contour grafting, which when you place an implant and there is a need for some bone grafting on the buccal uh, wall, you can use this material bits because it it does not resorb or takes a long time to resorb. So it will hold the space and it works very well as a contouring uh, in, 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 at the same time of implant placement. Uh, other bone material is the synthetic bone, uh, which is also osteo osteoconductive, doesn't have any osteoinduction potentials. It works like a framework. Uh, Different materials, bio bioactive glass, uh, calcium sulfate, calcium phosphate, um, synthetic hydroxyapatite. A lot of synthetic materials have been used. Uh, zero risk for disease transmission as well. And uh, the resorption is can be arranged from fast to slow resorption. I basically, personally, I don't use these materials for socket preservation or for bone grafting. Uh, some people use it for sinus grafting, uh, especially with a vertical approach. I think it might work well in that area as well, but I don't have a lot of experience using it for socket preservation and for ridge augmentation. I like to use the uh, allograft or allograft mixed with xenograft. Other uh, or the newly introduced categories uh, are um, growth factors, uh, which is basically uh, growth factors like BMB or uh, platelet derived growth factor, insulin uh, uh, like growth factor, have been found all of them to have some osteoinductive potentials. And uh, especially the BMB2 
have the strongest osteoinduction potential. It has been approved by the FDA for uh, use uh, for socket preservation and for also sinus augmentation. Uh, it comes in a liquid form and also it has a collagen carrier. You basically soak the collagen with the BMP and uh, you leave it for 15 minutes to, to, to soak and then you cut it into pieces and you use it uh, as a grafting material. And it gets really, really good results because it has a true osteoinduction potential. The other new form, which is gonna be the future of the bone grafting maybe at some point, is the bone substitute, substitutes with infused living osteogenic cells. Uh, that means that uh, progenitor cells such as uh, mesenchymal uh, stem cells uh, can be used alone or in combination with other materials. Uh, these cells will differentiate into osteogenic cells and can regenerate large bony defects when used with a scaffolding carrier. And these materials are still in the preclinical studies uh, that has not been approved for use yet. Basically, they're collecting or harvesting these cells. <clears throat> There's um, mesenchymal stem cells. And uh, with some type of treatment, uh, they uh, enhance the differentiation of these cells into osteogenic cells that can form new bone. This uh, uh, diagram here is taken from an article uh, uh, done by Dr. Zhao, and it talks about all the bone grafting techniques or bone grafting materials, sorry, that are in the market. And it's a really good uh, like uh, uh, article, talks about all the stuff that we already mentioned and also more. Uh, again, I encourage everybody to read it, basically, they categorize the bone grafting here into natural bone, which is taken from autogenous bone, allograft, xenograft, or uh, algae or coral bone. The synthetic bone, which is hydroxyapatite, calcium sulfate, polymers, bioactive, bioactive glass, etc., etc. It's a synthetic material. Uh, that has also the newly synthetic materials, which is the nano bone, the smart bone, etc., which has some uh, enhanced mechanical properties, but all of this is under the umbrella of synthetic bone. The other new addition is the growth factor based bone, which is the BMB infused. Uh, another category is the sticky bone as well, where we mix our bone with uh, PRF, and the final category is the bone substitute, substitute infused with living osteogenic cells as well. So let's look at some of the cases for socket preservation. And then after that, we'll start talking about bone augmentation. So uh, in this case, the patient came in, uh, She had, uh, there is a Fistula uh, developed in the uh, epical area for tooth number four. There's some pain, some pus coming out. She wants to have the tooth removed. So uh, I removed the tooth as traumatically as possible. And here we can see with my curate, I was inspecting the socket after cleaning and the buccal bone was uh, completely gone. Uh, against that tooth. So after cleaning the socket, what I did is with a collagen membrane, I placed it uh, like a wall, like I created a new buccal wall with this collagen membrane. It's not a plug here, it has to be a collagen membrane. And then I placed it like this. I created buccal wall basically. And then I placed my uh, bone grafting material inside. Then I flipped the membrane on top of the bone and I suture it. And this is gonna be left to heal by uh, secondary intention. So no need for primary closure here. 
if we're doing socket preservation. And this is how the area looks like after uh, five months of healing. And you can see a nice continuity of the soft tissue and the bone as well. So the ridge width was preserved in that case. And here I uh, came in after five months and I placed, I removed tooth number five and I placed two implants in the area and we can see the good amount of bone on the buckle of tooth number four. Another case where the patient also came in with the tooth number 14 has a perio lesion. There is a PA lesion on the mesial root of number 14, uh, perio pocket here, uh, some furcation involvement and loss of the uh, lingual wall, especially the mes mesial part of the lingual wall. I removed the tooth, I cleaned the socket and I placed a non-resorbable membrane in this case. I place it again, I created a pouch on the lingual. I place the membrane beyond the defect, at least three millimeters. And then I place my bone graft material. I fold this membrane on top of my graft and I suture it with a cross cross suture. This is how it looks after six weeks. And at this time I went ahead and I removed the membrane and underneath the membrane, we can see a, a tissue. It's like the, the pseudo perosteum. It's a, it's a connective tissue. And the uh, nice thing about using this type of, uh, this type of uh, membrane is first, it will preserve the space very well for you. The second thing is after you remove it, this, whole area of connective tissue will expose to the oral cavity and then the, um, uh, the epithelium will start to migrate. So you will end up with a good amount of keratinized tissue in that area. And this is how the ridge looks like after we remove the tooth. This is uh, another case where after removal of the molar, there was a loss of the buccal wall in the mesial root of that molar, as you can see here. This is the distal uh, buccal wall. It's still intact, but the mesial wall was completely gone. I placed again my uh, non resorbable membrane, PTFE membrane, beyond the defect and placed my bone graft, fold the membrane, crest cross suture. And this is how it looks like after five months of healing, I went ahead and I placed my implant and we can see here that the buccal contour was preserved in this, uh, in this case as well. So to sum it up, when we're, we are talking about socket preservation, uh, we are talking about the a procedure that is done at the same time of extractions. Uh, we want to evaluate the bone or the socket uh, walls, especially the buccal one. If the socket walls are intact, then we just place our bone graft, cover it with any type of collagen blood or a membrane and just do suturing. If the socket wall are not intact, if there's loss of, uh, of the buccal wall or some type of fenestration, we can then, we have to use some type of uh, resorbable or non-resorbable membrane, put it in the area and then to cover the bone graft material with it. And also with this type of procedure, we don't need to have a primary closure so the tissue can heal with the secondary intention. And this is a big uh, 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 difference from the other procedure, which is called the ridge augmentation. So when we're talking about the ridge augmentation, we're talking about uh, various surgical procedures uh, with the aim of restoring the ridge height and width uh, to a better uh, a better ridge for proper function, aesthetic and prosthetic uh, uh, appearance.
appearance. So uh, we want to increase the healed side. The ridge is already healed. There is no extraction involved. And we want to add more bone, make the ridge wider, thicker, maybe height-wise as well, in order to receive our implant or for other prosthetic uh, uh, treatment like a bridge, especially in the anterior zone we, where we don't want our point to be so high or so long, sorry, with a, with a gummy smile patient. This is one of the things that we need to consider. Uh, the general principles in ridge augmentation uh, are space maintenance. So we need to create the space for the new bone to form. We need to have tissue exclusion. Most of the time, we need to use a membrane to, uh, to contain this bone graft or this space where our bone is gonna grow in. We don't like epithelium. We don't like connected tissue to collapse and invade this area where our bone is healing. We need to have a blood clot that forms underneath the membrane or in that space to form new bone for us because it's a very important uh, step in bone healing, uh, which is the formation of blood clot. And we need to have a stability of this whole area. And as we all know, the bone needs to be stable in order for it to heal. One exception here is the uh, distracts and osteogenesis where we we cannot have stability. The bone has to keep moving. Two pieces of bone has to keep moving in order to create a space between them that will fill with bone later. And the big uh, difference between this and the socket preservation is the primary closure. We need to have a tension-free primary closure here in order for this to work. Uh, we cannot have an open wound healing in this type of procedures, which is the ridge augmentation. Again, if we, if we take a look here, we always want to start with our prosthesis plan. So we want to know where is our future Pontec or of our future implant supported crown is going to be. And then we look at the bone. Do we have loss in the width? Do we not have loss on the height? Or do we have a combination of height and loss? So you, we always want to look for the prosthetic plan. Where is the gingival margin of that prosthetic uh, implant crown or pontic is going to be? And based on that, we will decide how much bone and how much tissue uh, do we need to reach that stage. So what are the aims for the bone augmentation or the ridge augmentation? Is to reestablish sufficient quantity and quality of the bone for implant placement. Uh, and also to reestablish intermaxillary ridge coloration. Sometimes the uh, bone loss is so severe that the intermaxillary space is very huge and we need to vertically grow that bone as much as we can to, in order to have a, 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 a favorable crowd to root ratio if we're doing some implant uh, or for some other aesthetic demands and also to improve the aesthetic outcome overall as well as we spoke. So what are the classification of ridge defects? There is a lot of classifications. Some of them are simple. Some of them is so complicated. They come with decision trees and uh, a lot of information. It's hard to remember all of them. What I have or what I use mainly is the Siebert classification uh, done in 1983, which classify the defects as class one, two, three. Class one is only buccal lingual or horizontal defect. The vertical is good. We don't have any defect issue, uh, any vertical issue. The class two is we have loss in the vertical dimension. Buccal lingually, we're good. And the defect 
Type three is we have a combination of horizontal and vertical uh, uh, lack of, of, of bone. Uh, the Allen's classification, which is some type of modification to the Siebert classification, they classified the defect as mild if we need less than three millimeter of uh, bone, moderate three to six millimeter, and severe, which is more than six millimeter. So what are the various methods or techniques to do ridge augmentation? There is uh, various techniques. Mainly we can summarize them in this four or these four uh, 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 techniques. One of them is the onlay grafting, inlay grafting, distraction osteogenesis, and guided bone regeneration or GBR. So the onlay grafting, is to place a bone block on the surface of the bone, on top of the bone, which is whichever it's, uh, is it done uh, vertically or horizontally. You place it on the surface of the bone. You stabilize it by screws. This bone block can be autogenous bone taken from the uh, mandible or from the uh, iliac crest or whatever, or it can be an allograft also as we uh, as we saw as well, there are some uh, companies that have allograft bone blocks and it can be also a xenograft, stabilize it by screws. One of the benefits of this is that it has uh, the potential of preserving the space uh, because it's rigid. So it's self space preservation. Uh, the cortical bone, whether it's an allograft or autogenous bone, does not resorb very fast. So it will preserve the space for us very well. Uh, and uh, usually I like to cover it with a collagen membrane or a resorbable membrane just to enhance the soft tissue healing around it. So this is the first technique that we can use to grow bone vertically or horizontally on lay grafting. Other technique is called the inlay grafting, which is involve splitting a piece of bone on the ridge and move it apically. And then the donor graft material, which is also can be autogenous bone, xenograft, allograft, whatever you want. You can sandwich it in the middle, put it in the middle, like in this figure here. This is the, this is the bone piece that was split and moved apically. And these are two pieces of bone that were uh, bone graft that were placed in the middle between this piece of bone and this piece of bone and then you stab stabilize the whole area with the screws or with the plates. The potential here or the advantage here is the preservation of the blood supply, especially on the lingual side of this, uh, this graph. So the flap is open only from the buccal side and instrumentation only from the buccal area. We wanna keep the uh, flap uh, from the lingual side intact. But the big downside is that it's very hard to perform. It's very technique sensitive. Not everybody has the skills to perform such a procedure. The other method is to do distraction osteogenesis. Again, uh, a piece of or a block of bone is split on the crest. And then uh, the distraction device is placed and fixated, as we can see here in the photo. And then this device is activated, activated periodically. And the uh, uh, aim is to keep moving this piece of bone, the crystal piece of bone, keep moving it vertically, slowly, slowly, as it heals away from the basal bone and the area between the, the, the space that we are creating slowly, slowly, it's gonna fill with bone graft, uh, sorry, it's gonna fill with new bone and it's gonna form new bone slowly, slowly. Uh, again, 
it uh, has the potential of preserving the bone supply for uh, the, 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 the area. It's a formation of a new bone. So there is no bone grafting material needed here. It works great for vertical gain, uh, not too much for horizontal gain. Mainly if it's used, it's used for vertical gain. But again, the downsides are it's technique sensitive. Uh, not everybody can perform such a procedure. Splitting the bone in such a fashion is not an easy process to split this block of bone while keep it intact from the uh, palatal side or from the lingual side. And uh, fixating this also uh, osteo distraction, dis uh, the, the distraction device is not an easy job. And also for the patient to have this device in their mouth for six, seven weeks also is not very convenient for some of the patient. The other issue is it has a high complication rate, which is which are failure or an infection or whatever uh, uh, nerve alteration uh, uh, problems that might happen as well. And the other technique or the last technique we want to talk about this is the guided bone regeneration, which involves the placement of a membrane and a graft material. Uh, the membrane will uh, be stabilized and the membrane will contain or create a space underneath it for our new bone to form. It's a highly successful uh, procedure with high success rate and low complication. It's, it's one of the most commonly used techniques for ridge augmentation, which is placement of a membrane to exclude the tissues, which is the soft tissue, uh, whether it's epithelium or connective tissue, and have a nice uh, uh, space underneath it for the graft to heal and for a new bone to form. So if we look at the, again, at the evidence, um, we can uh, see that horizontally, on average, we can gain 3.7 millimeter. Uh, if we break it down, uh, they found that uh, the blockograft gained 4.1 millimeter on average, whereas the uh, guided bone regeneration or placement of a membrane and bone graft inside it gained 3.6 uh, millimeter. Not a big difference between the two techniques. Um, also in another study, they found that uh, the mean horizontal gain was ranging from 4.3 to five millimeter. Uh, and the range, was between zero to almost 10 millimeters. So some of the cases have zero millimeter gain. Some of the cases have almost 10 millimeter gain. So on average, you can predictably have four to five millimeter gain of horizontal bone with uh, either a GBR or with a block graft. The vertical bone, uh, the data on it is not as uh, much as the uh, horizontal uh, bone augmentation because uh, not a lot of people have successful results of the vertical bone augmentation. It's uh, hard uh, to gain bone vertically and it's more challenging. So. But the systematic review done by Dr. Urban concluded that the mean gain was eight millimeter uh, gain for os distraction osteogenesis. So, so when, when they used the distraction osteogenesis, they gained a mean of eight millimeter of bone. But the problem is that they have a complication rate of 47% uh, of the time. So half of the cases that was treated with distraction or osteogenesis had some type of complication. Uh, they also found that 12% uh, of 
the uh, guided bone regeneration had uh, had some uh, uh, some complications and the mean gain was 4.1. For block graft, the numbers were 3.4 mean gain and 23% uh, complication rate. So if we take a look at this study, we can conclude or we can see for them, guided bone regeneration was the safest. Uh, it has a decent gain of vertical bone, which is 4.1 uh, millimeters uh, and the distraction has the most gain but has a lot of complications so we need to study your case carefully and have a conversation with the patient about the complications and uh, other things that might happen and based on that you can decide which technique you would want to use Uh, again, this is another article done by Dr. Urban, and they uh, suggest a decision tree for vertical ridge augmentation. Uh, they categorize the uh, vertical defects into small, which is less than four millimeters, medium, four to six millimeters, and large, which is more than six millimeters. And basically what they're saying is the small defects, you can use whatever you want, you can use GBR, you can use only graft, it might work. For medium um, uh, cases, which is four to six millimeters, you can, can be done with GBR more predictably than the only grafting. And with larger uh, defects, they're suggesting either distraction or osteogenesis which have a high rate of complication or uh, stage GBR with non-resorbable membranes. And the key point here is to use a non-resorbable membrane. And because the non-resorbable membrane here will create the space and it will preserve the space for a long uh, period of time for our bone to grow in a vertical direction. So let's look at the, some of the clinical cases and we will be done with our lecture. So in this case, the patient was referred for placement of uh, implants and doing uh, ridge augmentation. As we can see, the ridge is uh, thin, uh, especially in the premolar area. Uh, the tissue though, here is also thin. There is uh, high frenum attachment and uh, especially in the anterior area again around the premolar and there is minimal amount of keratinized tissue. So one of the main issues or the principles with guided bone regeneration and ridge augmentation is that we need primary closures. So the soft tissue is very important for us to be of adequate amount and thickness to cover our graft and not to pull out after a, after a while or have some dehiscence or some issue. So we like to have a thick amount of keratinized tissue and the flaps to be thick in order to have a nice primary closure tension free. So I chose here to start with a free gingival graft that was placed on, on the area. So with uh, uh, what I did is a partial thickness flap in the area and then I, I harvested a long uh, free gingival graft from the pallet. I placed it, I stabilized, I stabilized it. And this is after two months of healing and we can appreciate the amount of keratinized tissue gain in the area and also the thickness of the soft tissue in that area. And at this point, we are ready to do our GBR or our bone grafting safely. So I opened the area and you can see that the bone was very thin. I chose to split the bone 
So with a disc, I did some two vertical cuts and one cut on top of the ridge here. And with a mallet uh, and a chisel, I split the bone a little bit to give it some space. And then we did, I did some decortication. And at this stage, we need also to manage our flap. The buckle flap, as we all know, we need to do some periosteal scoring for in order for us to release that flap and have it to, to pull it uh, coronally in order to cover our flap. The lingual and the lingual flap, especially on the um, on the uh, mandibular cases and the mandibular posterior cases, uh, are very important to manage these flaps as well from the lingual and to separate this flap from the mylohyoid muscle. So we will be able to displace it apically and cover our flap with it. And uh, um, the technique is, I would say, delicate. Uh, easy, but you have to be careful. Uh, it can be done with a finger dissection or it can be done with a blunt instrument. And the key point is to just dissect this flap, the lingual flap from the mylohyoid muscle. You don't want to invade the mylohyoid. You don't want to uh, dissect the mylohyoid muscle. You want the mylohyoid muscle to stay intact. Once you remove your flap, from this mylohyoid muscle, you will have a lot of tissue to play with. So you can displace this flap apically up to 15 or 20 millimeters to cover your bone wrap. Uh, I, here in the lecture, there is a link for a YouTube video. Uh, and it's really beneficial to take a look at it. They show you different techniques, how to manipulate this lingual flap. And also there is an article done by uh, Dr. Uh, Urban that explains the manipulation of the lingual flap step-by-step. Step. After flap uh, management, lingually and buccally, I uh, went ahead and uh, mixed my bone graft, which here in this case, I used a mixture of uh, aloe graft and uh, autogenous bone harvested from the area. I scraped some bone with a scraper. I mixed all of it together. And then I placed my collagen membrane first on the lingual. As you can see here, I placed two collagen membranes because the area was so large. I fixed these collagen membranes on the lingual with packs. I placed my bone graft and then I folded this membrane on over to the buccal side and I uh, also fix, fix this, these two membranes with some uh, titanium tags. And uh, this is how the membrane looks like after fixation. So we can see that underneath it, the space is contained and uh, the bone graft underneath it can heal without being disturbed. The, after that, the tissue was closed or the flap were closed with continuous uh, interlocking sutures. And this is the case after five months of healing. So we were able to convert the ridge from 3.1 millimeter to almost eight millimeter width and I was play, able to place three implants in that area with more than two millimeter of bone on the buckle. Another case as well, and this patient came in with pain, perioendolesion, there's a bridge in the area. Both of the teeth needs to be removed. So when I took a look at the radiograph and the clinical scenario, I knew that there is some type of bone grafting is going to be needed, but is it socket preservation is going to be enough? I don't think so. So what I chose here, I chose not to do socket preservation. I chose just to extract the tooth or the two teeth, sorry, let the area heal for six weeks. And this is how it looked like. So after six weeks, we have enough soft tissue for primary closure. 
for my final GBR or for my final ridge augmentation. So after six weeks, I opened the area. This is how it looks like, big defect, especially on the, the buckle wall is gone and the ridge on number 29 as well is very thin. So I cleaned all this tissue here and then we, I did some flab management on the lingual side and on the buckle side as well. I chose here to place a uh, titanium reinforced PTFE membrane. So it's not a, uh, a, not a non-resorbable membrane, uh, which has some titanium to make it stronger and hold the space better. The membrane was fixated on the lingual first. As we can see, bone graft is applied, flip the membrane to the buckle and the membrane was uh, fixated on the buckle with some tags as well. We can see the proximity of the mental nerve in this area as well. And the area where uh, left uh, also uh, were left to heal for like five months. And this is how it looks like. We have almost 8.4 millimeter width in the premolar side, which is more than enough to place an implant there. A key point here as well is primary closure. We have to have a primary closure, very good flap release from the buckle and the lingual. So we'll have a primary closure and the healing of our bone graft is not gonna be uh, disturbed. So in, the next case here, uh, we had a patient that had uh, two implants placed in number two and three, the maxillary arch. Number two was failed and it was removed. Number three, uh, they tried to salvage it by doing some bone grafting on it and then it finally failed again. So this is how it looks like when I open the flap. And as you can see, uh, the bone loss around this eight millimeter implant was significant. And the implant was just removed with uh, reverse talking it with my fingers. Uh, one thing I wanna point out here is the thickness of the tissue. As you can see here, the flap is of a proper thickness. So that's why no additional grafting was done here. And I was like sure that these <coughs> tissue would have enough thickness to contain my bone graft. This is how it looks like after removing the implant. And we can see that we need some vertical gain as well as horizontal gain. Uh, if we take a look on, 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 on the mesial side here, we have this peak of bone and on the distal side here, we have this peak of bone. And the goal is to restore our bone to a line that connects these two peaks of bone. So we're not gonna be able to go over these two peaks of bone that one on the distal of the premolar and one on the, uh, I would say, around the tuberosity area. Because of the repeated surgery in the area and the repeated failure in the area, I chose to use the infused bone graft, which is BMB or bone morphogenic protein grafting material. Again, it's a liquid with a carrier. You infuse the carrier, which is the collagen sponge, as you can see. You infuse it with the liquid. You let it uh, sit for 15 minutes and then you apply it under a titanium mesh. It has to be done with a titanium mesh, this type of bone grafting, because it's soft, it's collagen and infused with some liquid. It collapses, it doesn't hold the space. So we need to use something very rigid on top of it to hold the space. So we chose to use the uh, titanium uh, uh, mesh. And then a primary closure was done. As you can see and the area was healed for nine months. I waited extra time on this case just to make sure everything is fine. And this is how it looks after nine months. We can see that uh, uh, ridge have been restored to a nice vertical 
uh, height and also to a nice horizontal height. And the quality of the bone also, when you take a look at it, looks decent, looks good. And this is the final case, how it looked before, how it looked after, and we were able to place two implants in the area and hopefully they're gonna be restored soon. Another case here where we have a, a patient that lost her molars a long time ago, and uh, she had significant amount of vertical and horizontal bone loss in the area. The ridge is very thin as you can take a look, but also, again, the tissue is very thin. And literally when I check the tissue, I, I numbed the patient and I placed my probe. I tried to probe the tissue to the bone and literally the tissue was less than 0.5 millimeter thin. So it's very thin. If I try to do bone grafting with such a thin tissue, then the risk of exposure is going to be high. So what I what I decided to do is we decided to do uh, uh, again to use the the BMB and to do uh, 3D printed titanium mesh. But before that, I did again I did tissue grafting. Free gingival graft, I harvested it from the palate, I place it in the area, and it healed for two uh, months. And this is how it looks like after healing good amount of keratinized tissue and good thickness of the area here. And as you compare it with this top left, you can see the difference. And here I can feel confident now placing my graft. So the area was open, and uh, this titanium mesh was 3D printed. Uh, so we took the scan, the CT scan, uh, and then uh, was sent to a company who designed this 3D printed mesh and it came in. The mesh does not, or usually does not need any adjustment. You just place it and it fits the defect very nicely. Um, so in this photo here, we can see the ridge is paper thin knife edge ridge, the placement on the fit of the mesh. And here is the mesh after application of the bone graft or the BMB material inside of it and fixing it, fixing it with two uh, screws. Um, again, the lingual uh, dissection and buccal dissection for the flaps in order for to release the flaps from the muscle pole and to have a primary closure. And this is the primary closure with continuous interrupting suture, uh, continuous interlocking, sorry, sutures. And this is how the area looks at two months. So um, no exposure of the mesh and the uh, area looks fine. No uh, infection, no dohesins on the soft tissue. So at two months now, even if we have some exposure after this uh, stage, I would be uh, less worried about my bone graft. This is uh, another case also where the patient had a fail, failure of the implant of tooth number eight. The implant was removed, uh, I think, a couple of months ago. And as you can see in the graft and the, the scan here, the buccal wall is completely gone. What we have is just a lingual wall. So again, uh, we have multiple options here. We can do titanium mesh, we can do blocker graft, we can do PTFE membrane, even we can do resorbable membrane. A lot of things can work here. Um, what I used to, or what I decided to do here is, uh, I decided to do uh, an allograft plat, plate. So it's a plate of cortical bone. And instead of harvesting it from the patient mandible, it's already come in, in a packaging. It's a allograft material. It's a cortical bone, one millimeter thickness, very hard, uh, so you cannot bend it. And I, uh, I cut it and I shaped it in this form to avoid the nasal spine in that area. And that's how it fit. Uh, we placed two screws to uh, stabilize it and the hole between or the area between the plate and the bone 
was filled with uh, allogenous graft and a mixture of allogenous graft and autogenous graft. We mix it together and we place it uh, inside the area. And uh, everything was uh, covered by uh, a, a by exclude membrane, which is uh, debethelialized amnion chorion membranes, a new membrane coming, or not a new, relatively new, I'd say. Uh, membrane it has some biological factors which aid in the healing and also it promotes uh, angiogenesis and it will reduce inflammation and accelerate flap reattachment as well. And it also has some antibacterial uh, properties. And here, again, the, the, the bone plate will contain my uh, will contain my uh, my graft and will contain the space for me. So I don't need to have like a non-resorbable membrane or a PDFE or I don't have to stabilize my membrane because my space is good. I just need some tissue exclusion. I need to exclude this epithelium from going in, in inside or the connective tissue from going inside. And this is uh, one of the membranes that you can use for that matter. And this is how the area looks like after uh, one month of healing. Again, no exposure, the tissue looks good uh, and no infection and uh, the patient is comfortable. So with this case, I will conclude this uh, lecture. And uh, basically if you have an understanding of the biological principles of bone healing, and you had a good tissue management, you can use or you can achieve a good results regardless of the bone grafting material that you use <clears throat> or the bone grafting technique that you use. A key point here to differentiate is you have to understand what's the difference between socket reservation or reservation of the bone at the time of extraction and between the augmentation of the bone after removing the tooth. One, we need to have a primary closure for it, which is the augmentation. The other one, you can just place your bone graft with some type of covering on it and hope for a good, good, uh, him. Uh, with that, uh, I will. I wish you that uh, you enjoyed this lecture. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to Dr. Dumani or you can reach me out on social media. And thank you, everybody, uh, for listening and have a great day. Thank you.